Well, I'm going to ask that you continue to eat, but we want to uh, present uh, to you what the NRS Consortium is doing, and uh, the topic is performance and innovations in forage quality testing through NIRS. Well, my name is Dennis Walker, and I have been associated with the consortium about um, 14 years, and I operate the core facility at the Noble Research Institute that today we're going to be wearing the hat of what we are doing as a consortium. So what is the NRS Feed Forage Consortium, the story of the NRS Consortium? The group was formed out of a 1991 pilot evaluation of instruments in the Midwest. We talked about how important it was to standardize the instruments. We needed to get the instruments where they were predicting the same, they were using the same type of um, models and so that was part of that. The product, the pilot showed that the NRS methods and output were all over the board and at that time the goal was to match instruments and software. Uh, today we are uh, organized as a federal nonprofit and continue to advance the NRS usage in agriculture and excellence in NRS performance. So our mission is to promote, standardize, and optimize the use of NIRS through the development of robust, accurate prediction models and best uh, laboratory management practices. So when we went through this process of developing a mission statement, we were very intentional with the words that we used. To promote, we want to be promoting the use of NIR or um, forage testing throughout the industry, the ag industry support those. And the standardization, uh, whether it's through the use of good management practices, but to make sure that the labs that are using these methods are producing repeatable and accurate results. And when we think about optimizing, we want to make sure that our instruments, no matter what platform they're using, whether it's uh, FOSS, Unity, etc., they're able to use our prediction models to, to the, the best performance. So our vision is to lead NRS collaboration and applications in agriculture. By definition, a consortium is a group of individuals that's coming together for a common purpose to attempt to address issues that are commonly not able to be addressed as an individual. And so um, you know, we heard a good talk on the importance of bringing um, all the, Ralph talked about this, bringing all the players together, all the ones that have a, a vested interest in this, into the same room. And so we feel like we do that as a consortium. We have plant breeders, we have labs that are commercial labs, we have universities, we have our instrument companies that support, and they're all part of this consortium, and they bring different components together. We have nutritionists, whether they're working with the dairy or if they're working with um, beef cattle industry. So the benefits of being part of the consortium is that equations are available. Equations are, we'll look at the equations available. We'll look at the equation update process, member resources, and about current members and the board of directors. So what is the NIRS, or Near Infrared Spectroscopy, and why is it a powerful tool for forage analysis? If we look at what NIRS spectroscopy is, it uses the same premise that we're very familiar with, the principles of chemical analysis. So to test an unknown sample, you have to have uh, to compare it to something that you do know. So if we look at this example of starch concentration from 50 um, up to 250, and then if we look to the right, um, it's just the coloration of this starch sample, um, it's about 150. So by knowing a range of concentrations with the 
colors that's identifying it, we can identify unknowns. Same thing with NR. The near infrared region is from 700 to 2500 nanometers. So the NIR in NIRS, an unknown sample is compared to a database of known results. So the NIR, the NIR light passes through to an unknown sample and how the light interacts with the sample uh, records and calculates into numerical values. So the light source goes to a filter, it hits the sample, the, inor the organic bonds will be energized, they'll vibrate, they'll twist, and so that gives us a different uh, perspective of the absorption and reflectance patterns. And they're different between it's a, a carbon-hydrogen bond, an oxygen-hydrogen bond, or an oxygen-hydrogen bond. So the reflectance or the absorption of the test sample is math mathematically compared to the spectra of the reference sample that previously been assayed by standardized and industry approved wet chemistry. We've discussed this over and over, the importance of the wet chemistry and the reliability of that lab and the reproducibility of that. So what is the importance of forge analysis? Again, we discussed that within forges, there's a lot of variability just within the plant itself so between species to species, there's a lot of difference, whether it's Bermuda grass, whether it's alfalfa, or uh, a number of species that you could talk about. But within species, there's a tremendous amount of differences. And then you add the environmental factors into that, and then you add the regional effects that can be, um, that influences the plant quality. Then you really have a large pool of variability that you have to model. So um, from the consortium standpoint, by having memberships across the U.S., by collecting samples across all these regions, all these uh, conditions, across species, uh, species within um, or different growth stages, et cetera, within the species, we build in a lot of variability and we refer that as robustness uh, into our prediction models. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but this gives an indication that even within the crops, there's a range. And these were all ranges at the, uh, for the grasses, it would have been um, at boot stage and first bud and bud stage for the alfalfa. So harvesting at the same growth stage, you still can get variability within each constituent and especially in between species. So environmental factors that affect forage quality, plant maturity. As the plant matures, the crude protein de declines, the amount of fiber that's being laid down increases, and the overall quality decreases. So we'll look at the differences in uh, leaf stem ratios, but as the plant matures, there's more stem that's being grown and the proportion of leaf to stem is increased. So fertilization will affect quality. The proper fertilization can increase protein content and decrease ADF and NDF, but at the same time, if you apply too much in under certain conditions, we know that we can get nitrate poisoning, nitrate issues that are detrimental to the animals. As I mentioned, leaf stem ratios Importance, the more leaves increase protein and decreases fiber content of the forage. And this mainly, uh, there's some genetic things we can do, but primarily is affected by growth stage. And weeds are definitely a problem. They're typically higher uh, in fiber, and they can have number of antiquality components to them. So the more weeds decreases the overall forage quality. We talked about visually recognizing, trying to recognize the quality of the hay. So which hay lot is better, um, the better one? Who votes for the left side? Raise your hand if you think the left one's better. If you think the right hand side is better, raise your hand. The right hand is better. 
based on relative feed quality. Um, it has the lot one had just slightly better crude protein and had uh, basically the same TDN, but when we look at the relative feed quality and all the different constituents that goes into it, um, even though visually the one on the right looks, it, it really doesn't look good, but it has a, a higher feeding quality. So what are the benefits of the NIRS versus wet chemistry analysis? Uh, Rapid turnaround, decreased sample handling and preparation, decreased cost of analysis, non-destructive method, and improved repeatability and reproducibility. This is very eye-opening. We talked about how many times a sample can be handled. Um, wet chemistry, um, the column, the, the numbers for for moisture. The technician handles that two times, and it can take up to three hours. If you look at the number of times it's handled for, it's going down like a, to the IVTDMD, handled up to 24 times, and can take up to 60 hours, or 84 hours, depending on uh, if it's a 30 hour or 48 hour digestibility. So if you look at all these constituents, the total handling of 179 times and up to 325 hours. So you better have a lot of confidence in your technicians who's handling it, um, what mood they're in that day. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, or in our NIR, once you get past the grinding portion and handling of sampling, the actual running of the sample, it's handled once, and it takes about three minutes. So if you look at the factors that can in, uh, influence or maybe uh, um, where things can go south, it's a lot less likely, perhaps, with NIR. If the instrument's running correctly, if the data pay, if the equation models are correct, and you correct, correctly uh, select the right model to run the samples. So this was my live example when I went to our accounting department to ask for a new instrument. We were starting up a new lab. And so the accounting department said, okay, what is it going to cost to start this um, lab? And why don't we just send these off to a commercial lab? Because that's what they've been doing. It's a new breeding program. We were really amping up the number of samples. So I said, well, we're going to have about uh, 10,000 samples. If I send it to commercial lab with all the constituents we're looking at, it's going to be about $80 a sample. So I need my budget this year to be $800,000. Well, after I woke them up, because you know, they passed out from, from that number, I said, but we can buy a $60,000, $65,000 instrument, invest in that, get our money back the, in one year that we invested in it, become members of the consortium. We were going to pay $2,000 a year to run 10,000 samples. So that brought my cost to $0.20 cents a sample as opposed to $80 a sample. If I sent it to a commercial lab that was running in R, it was going to be roughly about $15 a sample that they were going to charge me. So for me to recoup all the costs, my, all the salaries and things that they were wanting, it was roughly about $5 a sample. So it was still a great deal for us, even including all the labor, to um, become a part of the consortium. And that's just from an economic standpoint. There's so many more benefits to being, being part of this. We talked about the improved repeatability and re reproducibility, uh, the, the error that's associated with the wet chemistry. And each time for crude protein, ADF, NDF, ash, and fat, the standard deviation was better than the wet chemistry. Um, and David McIntosh is going to go into some of that. And, and some of that is just due to the fact that when we send it off, the samples off to a wet chemistry lab, we do not just one sample, so by doing it in triplicates or whatever we choose, we reduce that error, and that is by reducing the overall wet chemistry through duplications, we can reduce the standard deviation that we have when we, um, when we release these models. 
So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Bobby Joe, and she's going to talk about the cal calibration performance.